Right. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I wasn't really complaining about having to walk up the stairs. <laughs> okay, why don't some of you move a bit closer? You all seem a long way away. I, what, what, what's wrong with the, uh, the, <laughs> the front rows? Okay, so um, looks as though the, the, the last minute people have stopped coming now. Okay, so let's, uh, let's start the session again then. Uh, and um, so uh, the next speaker is uh, Tatiana uh, Alieva from Madrid, uh, who's uh, going to, I'm sure, talk about something very interesting. So please. Okay. So this one, right? Yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> good morning. It is my pleasure to give you a short overview of the developed and developing technique of quantitative uh, uh, imaging with application to biomedicine, uh, applying the wide field microscopy and unstanding microscopy. Okay. So it, it's already working. So when I'm speaking about uh, uh, our own eyes, we, of course, don't uh, uh, can see details which are above uh, the 100 microns. So in that case, what we need, we need some instruments. And probably the simple instruments was the optical microscope. With a normal optical microscope, we can go to the details which are already in uh, this region, so we can see something about the 200 nanometers, which is already uh, three uh, order of magnitude less that we can see with our own eyes. If we applying uh, the uh, super resolution technique, we go even further, so we can see in that case something which is on the order of the size of the virus and which belong to the 20, 50 nanometers. And then we, see, uh, we want to see even something smaller, uh, the structure and study the structure of the proteins, for example, so we can use the electron microscopy or we can use the X-ray techniques, which is our now is a very active area in uh, these studies. But um, so with uh, the normal light microscopy, what we can study? We can study the cells, the animal and the plant cells, and not only their size, because the size usually of the cells is uh, around uh, 20, uh, 30, 10 microns, but what we want to see, what is inside of the cells. And if we are speaking about the bacteria, so their size is around uh, the microns, also the two, one microns. But uh, what exactly we want to know about these small subject, uh, objects? Do we know uh, uh, if uh, we are speaking even uh, about the imaging of the big objects, so we see them only from the one side. So probably in order to know what is going on the other side, the object has to be uh, rotated. But it's even not enough because we usually want to know what is inside of this object. So in, uh, for the macro um, size object, what we used, if we want to apply non-invasive uh, technique, so if we don't want to cut the object and to look inside, we are using usually the X-ray tomographic techniques, or it might be MRI techniques, etc. So something similar we also want to do, but on the microscopic uh, level. And uh, uh, in this case, we will speak about the quantitative imaging. Um, what we need to get 
what we can uh, name like a good image. Of course, uh, we say that we have to magnify uh, the object in order to see it uh, because of our proper limitations. For example, here you see the two images which are obtained with the same magnification range, but they are quite different. Why they are different? Because one of them is obtained with a larger numerical aperture and another one with a smaller one. And as uh, Corinne Shepard explained you two days ago, that uh, numerical aperture is important uh, to uh, process the high frequency, sp high special frequency content of the scattering li light, which is responsible for the sharpest uh, shapers the uh, details which we, uh, the contrast uh, which we can see in our image. So the numerical aperture is the size of your lens is important to uh, see uh, the image in the good conditions. Another important thing is the correct illuminations, and so uh, the most uh, part of the talk will be related to the importance of the illuminations in the imaging uh, process. Uh, now, we don't uh, want to see the image with our proper eyes, so usually we used the, uh, the CD camera to the digital camera in general to see it, and so we have uh, we need to have uh, the detector with a good dynamic range, and also with the smallest pixel size. And uh, of course, we need a good optics uh, without aberration, then a good alignment, etc. Uh, so, uh, the, the outline of this talk will be devoted to uh, considering the different type of illumination, the illumination with coherent and partial coherent light. Then we will speak about what we understand as the quantitative imaging. Quantitative imaging sometimes uh, has the name, the name quantitative phase imaging, and so we will speak about the phase retrieval method applying for the quantitative imaging in microscopy. And then we uh, uh, will consider the proposals for the approaches for the uh, recovering of the three-dimensional objects from the, um, uh, in, uh, in microscopy and uh, with coherent and partially coherent light. And then we will uh, speaking a little bit about the illumination coherence engineering, so how we can uh, fastly change the coherence property of our illumination. Wait, this. Yeah, it says quite. Uh, okay, so um, first of all, let us speak a little bit about. Uh, let us let us speak uh, a little bit about the different type of light which is illuminate our object. Uh, probably in the, uh, you remember from the uh, definition how, how we can uh, describe uh, the uh, light in the books uh, of the undergraduate students. So in that case, we describe it with the amplitude and with the phase. But this is the case only when we consider the coherent light. And the coherent light, it means that the perturbation of the field in the different, uh, in the different point are completely correlated. And if it's not the case, so and that uh, we have uh, to choose another approach and we have to consider the correlation uh, functions. And in particular, if we use the Gaussian statistics, so we have to consider the, only the two-point correlation function between uh, the, uh, which describe the perturbation in two points, which are R1 and R2. So you see that even we consider the light in one plane, so it is a 2D problem, uh, it is, much more complicated when we're using the partially coherent light 
if uh, comparing with the coherent one. In the coherent one, we have amplitude and the phase. So this is explained with a complex field amplitude, with, which is a two-dimensional, uh, in general, complex function. And in the case of the partially coherent light, we already have four-dimensional um, a complex function. And the worst thing is that we cannot measure directly neither the complex field amplitude or the uh, this two-point creation function, which in the case, if we consider scalar and monochromatic fields, we can name like a mutual intensity. Why we are calling it like a mutual intensity, because if we calculate it in the points R1 equal R2, what we will get, we will get the intensity distribution. And the intensity distribution we can easily measure. So the problem is if you want to characterize the light, how from the intensity distribution to recover the phase information, if we consider the coherent light, or how to recover the mutual intensity, if we consider the partially coherent one. Why we are speaking about the partially coherent light and coherent light when we would like to consider the image formation through the microscope? Uh, because depending on this uh, illumination, we have completely different images. Uh, we will consider the scheme proposed, uh, the illumination scheme proposed by August Kochler in uh, uh, more than 100 years ago when, uh, uh, when he worked for this company. And uh, in that time, it was very important to get the uniform distribution of the intensity of the illumination in the plane where you put your sample. And so he found that if the lamp, which is somewhere here, is projected to the back focal plane of the condenser lens, and the condenser lens is uh, uh, responsible to illuminate properly, uh, concentrate the light on the sample, uh, then the image of this source never will coincide with the image of the, uh, the, uh, the spacement when you will going to analyze. And it is a nice thing. But apart from that, now we know that it also allow us in the simple uh, case, uh, 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 change uh, the type of the illumination from coherent to the partially coherent light. How? Only closing and opening the, closing and opening uh, this uh, uh, condenser aperture, which is, can, yeah, which is here. Why we can do it? Because if we applied uh, the Van Sitter Cernicke theorem, and which we suppose that illumination of uh, the original illumination of our source is completely incoherent, and we project it to the back focal plane of the, our condenser lens, then in the plane of the, our sample, uh, uh, the coherent states which uh, will be described, so the mutual intensity of this illumination will be described like a Fourier transform of the intensity distribution we have in the uh, back focal plane of the condenser. Uh, and uh, uh, so it will be before the, uh, the light passing through the object and when it passing through them, so the mutual intensity change correspondingly when we take uh, the and then uh, the mutual intensity of the illumination beam and multiply them for the transmittance function of our sample. And so uh, this is US corresponds to the transmission function of the, of, uh, of the object. We, uh, 
uh, this transmission function is in general, we can consider like a complex function because uh, uh, the, the um, uh, almost transparent uh, sample, the changes in the phase. Uh, it is important to say that why the cochlear elimination is good, because if we consider the intensity distribution of this elimination, we can find, so if we put here R1 equal R2, we will obtain that this is, will be the constant, and so the elimination will be uh, uh, constant along all the samples. So it was uh, the people wanted to do, but the illumination will be, the intensity distribution will be the same, but not uh, the um, cohe uh, coherence or correlation property of our light. But uh, the good thing of this correlation property is that they will be shift invariant because you see that uh, the dependence uh, of the mutual intensity of these two points depends on the difference between them. So we have uh, something which is also called like a shell model beam, so shell model elimination beam. In order to, uh, in two words, describe what is the parameters uh, of the, uh, what is, what is the, the state of the coherence of our illumination, we can use the coherence parameter, which is related to the uh, numerical aperture of our condenser, which is uh, in general related of the size of this aperture and the numerical aperture of our objective. So when S uh, is uh, equal uh, almost zero, which is, is too small, it means when we closed the aperture of the condenser, so we have the coherent light, and when we open it, we have uh, uh, the partially coherent or almost incoherent one. Okay, but we can do something else. Suppose that uh, we um, change on, or we can project this, a certain image, which has to be incoherent, to the back focal plane of our condenser. And, uh, and this, what we will project, is, uh, is shown on this upper uh, line. And let us look how it will uh, reflect in the formation of the images of the simple sphere. So you see that uh, in uh, this case, when this is a coherent light, we have a lot of fringes. After that, we have some second in focus. And after that, because the sphere is working like a lens, so we see the image of what we projected to the condenser plane. But now let us use the line. So what will go in that case? So in the case of the line, you still have these fringes, the center difference fringes in that direction, which corresponds uh, to the almost coherent light in that plane, but these uh, fringes are almost washed out in the other plane, because in that case, your illumination is almost uh, incoherent or less coherent. We can do something uh, even different, so we can combine the different uh, type of uh, the color, so we can do it, for example, with a green light in one direction and the red line in another one, so we again obtain the very confusing images, so, uh, or we can uh, do it like in triangle uh, form, and so you have it like that. So if we consider only this, um, this row, so the defocused images, it's even very difficult to say that we have a sphere, right? But if we look at it in the focal plane, so in the focal plane, so this is uh, the, focused, uh, the focused light, so in that case, you see that they are very similar. Why? Because in that case, uh, uh, your uh, illumination, as you remember, is uh, uniform, and you obtain exactly uh, and uh, uh, using the description of shell model, uh, shell model beam, you 
uh, image will not be dependent on the coherence of your light. Uh, if you go further, so uh, you can see, as I said, you uh, almost what type of the illumination you see. So what I want to take your attention to what? That depending on the illumination, in that case, I know that the object that I had were the sphere, but if it's not, so it's quite confusing to decide what exactly I observed. So what is exactly the, uh, the object that I want uh, to analyze? <laughs> but maybe I can go here. Go in here. This or that? This? Okay. Uh, so in, in okay. So in other things about uh, about uh, the partially coherent light. So so let us now to decide what is the better to to use partially coherent light or coherent light. So uh, I know that you have uh, the special uh, laboratory about the speckle imaging. But sometimes the speckle is uh, quite a negative thing. So let us uh, make the following experiments. So you have uh, the level of the skater. And what is your task? Your task is to form the images of this sphere with this I belong. So let us use a coherent light and the imaging plane correspond to that. So in both cases, you see this, um, these skaters. But if we want to see through the skaters, so if I want to see these spheres, uh, in the case of the coherent light, it is very difficult to find them. And in the case of the partial coherent light, it's quite easier to find where they are. So probably uh, the partially coherent light is much better if you have the uh, it's a sample where you have some uh, uh, skaters which are not belong to what you want to observe. Okay, now uh, let us say about, uh, about uh, speak about the another. doesn't work because we tried it. Okay, so let us look to the following six. So we have the same object. The object is the diatom, but it is focusing with a coherent and partially coherent light, exactly in the same defocusing position. And what we see, we see completely different images. So how I can interpret these images because if my object is in 3D, so how I can find what is uh, its form, what is the 3D form of these images if depending on the uh, type of the illumination, they are completely different. Uh, we might notice that uh, somehow the partially coherent light has the better optical sectioning, so it is defocused more rapidly, and therefore maybe I can have a better guess about uh, its uh, dimension in the direction. Um, so it is one uh, of the things one. I'm sorry because it's something happened. Okay, okay. So what we understand uh, uh, under the words, uh, what we want to, to study, uh, uh, to get uh, from, from the images. Of course, we want to know the form of our object. And this form, 
which not only uh, the form outside, but also inside, for example, of the cells or of the cell. We want to know the measure something. So we want to know uh, the measuring, how, how much it is in transfer and, uh, and axial direction. And we want to know something about the composition. And when we're saying about the composition, we probably want to know the changes of the refractive index of our, our sample. And it is more or less what we are understanding under quantitative imaging. Uh, but uh, how we can get the quantitative imaging? Because uh, we know that uh, the direct measurement only uh, from direct uh, measurements, we only obtain the intensity distribution of them. So for that purpose, we uh, have to use the computational imaging in general. Um, the quantitative imaging is uh, often called the quantitative phase imaging. Why? Because the biological microsco uh, microscope samples, they have the bad absorption. And if contrast, and in that case, uh, they can be, so this is a bad thing, of course. And, uh, but there is also a good thing. So we can treat them like a only face object. And uh, if we can do it, so we can probably recover the face of the, our image. But how we can do it if we uh, can measure directly only the intensity distribution? So we can use the computational method to recover them. So I will discuss a several one how we can do it. Um, why? Uh, uh, so in general, there are different applications of the phase retrieval method. One of them is a digital refocusing. And the digital refocusing is the following. Imagine that you uh, register the uh, image of, uh, uh, of your sample. And in the next day, you decided that probably you had to refocus it in a little bit in another plane, or you want to send that image to uh, another person, and this person decided that it's not a correct plane to, to, uh, to, to look in this uh, sample. So what can you do in that case? If you can recover the face of your, um, of your complex field amplitude of your image, then you can make the, this refocusing digitally. For example, in the following picture, you have the intensity distribution measured from the simple analogical uh, refocusing. And on this place, uh, in, in, in these images, you, we apply this digital refocusing. So we measure the stack of the intensity distribution, we recover the phase, and on this, uh, from this recovering phase, we can go and see something in the planes which we didn't measure. Uh, so uh, it is one of the application of the phase retrieval, and another one, which is quite a simple one, is to recover from the phase Support, uh, supposing that we use a canal uh, approximation of the geometrical optics, we have recovered the thickness of our object, so we, we know uh, more or less the accumulated uh, uh, path uh, of uh, our, uh, our light passing through this object. And uh, from the knowledge of this form, we can recover the a refractive index, but in this case, it is like accumulated refractive index. So let us speak about how we can recover the phase. There are different methods, and uh, at the moment, we will speak about the coherent light. So a coherent light, we need to recover the phase directly, so it's uh, probably the, the more e uh, much easier problem that uh, if we are going to the partially coherent light. So uh, we usually get uh, several 
uh, measurements of the intensity distribution obtained by defocusing or by interferometric techniques. And uh, uh, the probably the more important, uh, you know, more useful uh, um, algorithm applying for that is a Hertzberg-Saxon uh, type algorithm or the method which is interferometry or allography or the transport of intensity equation or phase space tomography. So let us speak about the first one. So this is iterative technique uh, uh, proposed uh, in uh, uh, almost uh, 50 years ago. And uh, it consists in the following. So we measure the intensity distribution of our object in two planes, in uh, the imaging planes and in its Fourier planes. And then we try to recover the phase information about our, um, our original uh, field uh, distribution in the sample plane. So what we are doing, we're making, uh, we are making, uh, we take the amplitude, which is a square of the measured intensity distribution. We may add the arbitrary phase, or we may put it a constant, and we make the Fourier transform. In the Fourier transform, we obtain a certain amplitude and the certain phase. So let us, but we already measured the intensity distribution in the Fourier plane. So what we are doing, we change this, uh, our guess about uh, the amplitude uh, of the uh, intensity distribution in the fu uh, Fourier plane to the what we have measured it. And we, uh, we uh, use the phase which was calculated from this first iteration. After that, we make the inverse Fourier transform, and uh, again, we do the same things. So we change the amplitude of our field, and we remain the phase which we calculated here. After that, we make uh, several loops, and, uh, uh, and we hope that the uh, this process, this iterative process, will converge. How we can decide when it converges? So we have to compare the uh, intensity, uh, the, the, the amplitude that we uh, obtained, the, the difference between the, uh, generally there is a, the different, the different uh, method uh, to do it, but probably the simplest one, so we can compare what we uh, obtained from the one iteration and iteration n, and compare it with, uh, with the next one. If, if it's almost the same, so we can say that the processes converge. Sometimes it converges to the wrong uh, solution, of course, but um, in order to uh, resolve this problem, we probably need more information about our uh, our, uh, our sample. So what we need to this, we probably need more diffraction pattern, not only in the far field, not only for Fourier transform, but also something which is in the Fresnel diffraction region. So what the people are doing. Uh, we can use the defocused images, or we can use the diffraction pattern in the asymmetric system. So what we understand as the symmetric system is when instead of use the, uh, the, the spherical lenses to form, for example, defocused uh, uh, images, we can use the some cylindrical lenses which will uh, break the symmetry of the system and provide uh, more phase diversity in our reconstruction process. Of course, sometimes, for example, in X-ray, when they uh, uh, try to recover the information about the protein, so they use like a constraint, some guess about the size, form, etc. So this is uh, process is even more complicated. Um, uh, in the most things, the people are using uh, the paraxial approximation uh, in order to get, uh, so, so in, the, in the standard sec, uh, 
Fourier transform. So Fourier transform, we use the Fourier transform. So Fourier transform, we know how to calculate. But in the case when we are using the Fresnel diffraction pattern, you need for this uh, iterative construction model calculate the beam propagation from one plane to another plane. And usually the people are using uh, uh, the paraxial approximation. It means the Fresnel integrals. So paraxial approximation uh, uh, corresponds to the following. So we have to resolve the Helmholtz equation. And we suppose that uh, the uh, fast changing of uh, our of our field in the direction of propagation are described by this exponential because uh, the, where Z is a direction of, the, of propagation. Then substituting this expression in the Helmholtz equation, which is, by the way, this uh, is a wave equation for the monochromatic, uh, for the scalar monochromatic um, field, we obtain this one and we drop this term because we already uh, suppose that the first changes along the propagation distance were taken into account in that exponent. And uh, so supposing this condition, which in general corresponds that we consider that uh, the wave vector of the scattering uh, uh, light, uh, diffracted light, uh, has uh, the small angle with the direction of propagation. So we come to this one, which is a paraxial approximation of our equation. So in this paraxial approximation, we can not only consider the propagation in the free space, we can add several lenses. And to write this approximation in the integral form. And so if we are doing like that, when we including in our pass already uh, the uh, lenses, which might be uh, uh, spherical, which might be uh, cylindrical ones, but they have to be aligned. Uh, so in that case, the kernel will have the following form, where this coefficient A, B, C, D corresponds to the ray transformation matrix, which is quite easy to calculate using uh, the geometrical uh, optics approximation. Uh, so uh, you see that when B equals zero, so we have the imaging conditions, and uh, this kernel is reduced to the delta function with uh, some magnification we described by this parameter A. And in the case uh, when it is not, when we in the Fresnel, uh, generalized Fresnel regime, so we have this uh, quite, uh, at the first glance, complicated formula. But it's not the case if we consider, for example, A and d equals zero. So in that case, we obtain the simple uh, kernel for the uh, Fourier transform. And in the case when a and d equal one, so we have the normal Fresnel transform. So this is some kind of the generalization of the Fresnel transform. And as I said, that uh, it is simplified a lot, the propagation of the beam uh, uh, through the system which contained uh, the different elements, which is usually happened in uh, our life because we not only have the objective, so after that we have to project it to our, our uh, detector, etc. Um, so uh, again, this A, B, C, D coefficient are related to the position and uh, uh, direction of propagation of the beam passing through the system with the position and uh, the direction of beam propagation entering to the system. Uh, in spite, uh, it is in general a matrix which is four by four. In that case, it has uh, 16 parameters, but it is symplectic and therefore it is, has only 10 parameters to describe that. So, um, now let us consider uh, some example of how we can 
get uh, the face from the defocusing imaging. So, uh, uh, of course, in order to make this defocusing, one thing is we can move our lens, or our, 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 uh, uh, our detector, our CD camera. But the problem is that the uh, mechanical movements probably produce some enlargement. So what we can do instead, we can put here the special light modulator. And this special modulator, can, uh, we can program it in this such a way that it works like a digital lens. And so in that case, we can do it more faster obtaining these uh, defocused images uh, because uh, everything we uh, can be changed with a video rate, so it's more or less 30 frames per second. And uh, another thing that there is no problem uh, with alignment of our system. So people did it and uh, they measured nine intensity defocused images. Two of them are represented here. And then using the iterative algorithm, uh, as I explained you for the case of the Fourier transform, but it's a little bit complicated because they have uh, several uh, uh, intensity distribution measurements and propagation between them uh, are described with the generalized Fresnel transform. Uh, they obtain the information about the face, and this is the representation of that uh, with also another problem that it has to be solved is unwrapping of the face, because from this iterative process, we obtained our lens, but with the interval of from zero to two pi. And sometimes the thickness of our object is more than a wavelength, and therefore we have to apply the special algorithm to uh, make them uh, th this face in accordance with the size of our object. And so there, is, there are some special algorithms which is quite time consuming and often not uh, correct, but uh, the people are working on this problem. Uh, so can we do it the same with the partially coherent light? Because we said that the partially coherent light probably provides us some uh, advantages with respect to speckle noise uh, and, uh, and other stuff. So yes, we can it. So we do it uh, uh, in particular with a similar setup, but instead of using uh, the special light modulator, which is quite expensive, so the special light modulator probably will cost, uh, I don't know, the, the, the the good one might be 100, um, 100, 10, 100, uh, 10, 10, 000, uh, euros. But uh, we used uh, the electrical tunable lenses, which also li uh, named like uh, fluidic lenses. And so with uh, the price of that is uh, uh, six uh, hundreds only. Uh, and for this, particular application, the only thing that we need is a defocus our image. And, uh, uh, but uh, another new thing is that we use a partially coherent light. And uh, using this setup, we um, obtain the several images, so it's uh, also around the 10, image, uh, 10 defocused images. And uh, uh, every, each image is measured in 10 uh, microseconds, and uh, the uh, object wave field is already reconstructed in more than uh, 20 minutes. But what is the procedure of the reconstruction of this phase information of uh, our uh, sample when we are using the partially coherent light? So in that case, we can uh, notice that the intensity distribution of partially coherent light and this paraxial approximation, we can uh, uh, think that it, uh, we, we can relate to the intensity distribution of the coherent light as a convolution of it with what, with intensity distribution which we have in the, um, uh, back focal plane of our condenser. So 
making a deconvolution, we can, uh, if we know this, uh, this uh, illumination of our system, we are able to recover this uh, virtual, I would say, uh, coherent intensity distribution via the virtual because uh, we, uh, we did not measure it. What is measure it, the intensity distribution of the partial coherent light. So it is already free of the speckle. And uh, after that, we can apply it using that, we can apply it the algorithm similar to the uh, what I explained you before, and recover the infer face information about uh, our images. So it was uh, tried first for the uh, spheres, which is diameter of four and a half uh, microns, and uh, uh, for the different type of the illumination, so the different degree of partial coherence, and uh, we reconstruct the thickness of uh, the, this accumulation, the phase accumulation in general when you um, have been passing through this sphere and they uh, match very well with uh, what we expected to find. So knowing uh, uh, from the knowledge of the form, we can also find the, uh, the uh, refractive index of our sphere. Another approach, which is uh, too close to that, but it is not uh, iterative, it is uh, used the transport of intensity equation. So we again stay with the paraxial approximation of the helium coats equation, and we represent our beams like a square modulus of the intensity and the phase. Uh, if we take this equation and multiply uh, by the uh, uh, conjugated uh, value of our field and sum it with the conjugated equation, uh, paraxial equation multiplied by the not conjugated field and we make the rest uh, uh, for one from another one, we will obtain uh, this equation which uh, which was uh, first, I think, uh, derived by the Turgi and uh, uh, is known in the literature like a transport of intensity equation. So you see that from measurement of the differences in the intensity distribution in the closed position in Z direction, in the direction of propagation, we are able to find the gradient of your face. In the case when uh, your object is almost transparent, so this is intensity distribution in the focal plane is almost constant, we even can uh, put it outside of these brackets and then we will have uh, the Laplacian of the, of the face. So how we can measure this derivative it's quite easy. So if we are staying in the focusing plane, so we can do defocusing delta, uh, for uh, delta zeta in one direction and defocusing to the another direction, we can rest them, divide it for, uh, for this uh, uh, double uh, delta zeta. And uh, in that case, we already obtained it. Of course, uh, from the theoretical point of view, it's very easy, but it's not so easy in the practice. Uh, first of all, because uh, you have uh, here intensity distribution, which might have the zero values, uh, and because we have the noise, and so usually the people don't use only two intensity distribution, but use m much more. Uh, for, uh, and uh, also in the recent paper, it was uh, acknowledged that usually it's not necessary to measure them equidistantly, and it is much because in that case you need a quite a huge number of these defocused images to obtain 
the correct uh, uh, results for this, uh, for the calculation of the phase. But you can do it uh, in the exponential spacing. In that case, uh, the, um, the images captured far away from the focusing are responsible for the low frequency and which are closer for the high frequency. And uh, therefore, we will be able to recover the, uh, the, uh, the face information from the less images, then we can do it with the more or less the same precision if we do it the uh, specially equidistant stack of the intensity distribution. So uh, we consider this uh, uh, transport of intensity equation applications for the coherent light, but there are also uh, the generalization for the partially coherent light in particular in uh, in this uh, Petroselli and uh, Laura Waller papers. So if you are interested in it, you can go inside. Now, let us look to another uh, possibility to recover the phase. And it is related to the holography. Uh, I have realized that this year it's uh, already 70 years of the inversion of the holography, which was uh, uh, proposed, uh, explained the, the image formation from this point of view by the Dennis Gaber, who received his Nobel Prize in, uh, in, 1900, uh, in 1971. So, uh, he uh, tried to recover the face information, or in general, he wanted to see the object in that case. And how you can see the object if the only thing that you can measure is this intensity distribution. So he said, okay, what is the intensity distribution which we uh, really measure it? So it is the superposition of the, uh, of the illumination beam and the beam scattered by the objects by the, uh, which we want to, to visualize. And so multiplying uh, this, so separating them, he found that this intensity distribution is equal of the intensity distribution uh, uh, of the scattered, uh, the, the reference uh, light, plus the intensity distribution of the object light and these two terms which have the information about the phase directly, uh, uh, somehow directly information because also this information is in the intensity distribution. You will consider the propagation, uh, the, uh, if we will capture the several uh, intensity, uh, intensity distribution global in the different uh, zeta position, for example. But uh, in that case, if we are doing only in one play, plane, so we see that the phase information are in these two terms. And in one terms, we have our object, which we uh, plane, which uh, wave, which we want to recover. And in another one, we have conjugated of that. So these two terms, which are usually interesting in the holography applications, and uh, they are called like a twin terms because they are corresponds to the, um, our object field, uh, but uh, one of them is conjugated to another one. It means that if one of them is in, fo in focus, another one is not. And uh, therefore, the reconstruction of this type of holography is quite uh, different, difficult, um, make it difficult because we always see both type of this illumination. So, but how we can recover this information of uh, at least uh, try to recover the information about the object field. So what we have to do is multiply our intensity distribution on the um, reference beam. It means that propagate the uh, reference beam 
to the photograph which we taken from the um, previous uh, scheme, and then we will obtain that we have in general two images, so one image which corresponds uh, to the uh, to the uh, our original uh, original object, and another one with uh, we call it like a twin image which will be formed here. So it was uh, the idea of Gaber how to explain it and how to try to see the uh, object uh, after the recording the information which contained not only the intensity distribution of uh, uh, about the intensity distribution of uh, this um, of this object but also about the space. But now we can do this process not in the analog way, but in the, in the digital way. So we also captured the hologram uh, with, uh, but, but this hologram is uh, exactly the same like uh, one intensity distribution that we can measure with uh, our microscope. And uh, uh, then, uh, in, uh, in order to see it in a large way, we need to illuminate it again, maybe with not, uh, no, no, not a plain way, but uh, with a spherical way in order to get it larger or something like that and see it. But now this reconstruction problem we can uh, resolve in the, our computer because we know the information of the propagation of our beams from one plane to another one. So what uh, we are doing, we capture the hologram, but not in the form of the, uh, the digital way using the CCD camera. And after that, we're trying to recover it. And if we recover the field, so we will be able to recover the face information about, about it. And uh, uh, the problem of, uh, uh, of the Gabber uh, scheme of holograms is that uh, uh, we have, uh, the, your, your object is always superposed with this is twin uh, object. And it's quite, sometimes it's quite uh, difficult uh, to resolve uh, this problem. So another proposal by Les and Upadniks was not to use the reference beam, which is original in microscope is for free because this is illumination beam, but use it apart with some uh, inclination. In that case, what is going on that these two objects will not be in the same line, and therefore you using the Fourier transform, you can, in the digital, uh, in, in the analog way, separate it uh, uh, only by the filtering on the correct, uh, the correct terms in the Fourier domain. The problem of the offline holography application, digital uh, offline holography, is that in order to separate them, this is two twin images and from the, the, the CD term, you need quite a big uh, angle between the object and the reference beam. But from another uh, uh, side, you need uh, to register it using the CCD camera. But the CCD camera has uh, a pixel size which is not enough for, 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 in order to capture the fringes, which is quite close one with respect to another one. So in that case, there is a trade-off between the enlarge this angle or to make it smaller in order to capture in the conditions, in the good conditions, these holographic fringes. But uh, even let us to see how we can solve the problem of the uh, face recovering if we have inline hologram 
or it also will work for offline hologram. And this proposal uh, um, was from 1997, uh, from this year by Yamaguchi and Shang. And uh, uh, the proposal is phase shifting digital holography. So it what it consists. So let us use some phase shifting of our reference beam. Uh, if we again write the expression for the uh, Gabor time uh, type uh, holography, so we see that we have also the intensity distribution of our object, the intensity distribution of our uh, reference beam, and we have the model of the product of both of them, and we have uh, here the cosine where entering the face of the object and the face of the, your reference beam. Now, let us change the face of the reference beam using, for example, uh, the, uh, the mirror which is uh, controlled by the piezo elements. So if we can change this face with a certain precision, for example, uh, for uh, four different uh, faces like a Pn divided by two, so it will be uh, alpha equal zero, alpha equal pi over two, alpha uh, equal pi, and alpha, alpha equal uh, three pi over two. So in that case, we will be able to recover the face information only resting the intensity distribution measuring with the different um, retarding of our reference beam. Uh, reference beam. So it is nice uh, idea. So we will be able, using this holographic techniques, recover uh, the face of the object. Uh, so there are a lot of variation of this scheme, so it might be also applied for the offline uh, holography. And here you see uh, uh, the recuperation of the face uh, of the some cancer cells obtained by this method. So this is a hologram. This is a face image, and you see that the face image is very strange. So what it is? It is this the wrapped image because of the face because it is uh, in the range of uh, only 2 pi. And applying the unwrapping algorithms, you can recover the, uh, your face, which is correspond on the face uh, image of your cancer cell in that case. And uh, from this, uh, from these results, we can measure the thickness of our object and so uh, to say something about its refractive index if more or less we are able to uh, manage uh, to, to find its form. But okay, so we have considered different uh, um, waves how to find the information about the face. But is it the, pro uh, the problem, we solved already the problem of the uh, formation uh, of our object. Can we say what is its form exactly? Can we say what is the refractive index in some of its part? No, we have the information about the accumulation index, uh, refractive index, and we have uh, uh, information about the phase, but it is the phase not the phase of the transmitter's function of our object, even if it is uh, um, almost transparent. This is phase which we recover. This is the phase of the image. And the phase of the image is not exactly the same as the phase of the uh, of the uh, of the object which we have uh, to recover. Why? because of the two things. First of all, that where we're measuring, we're measuring this here. But what we want to know, we want to know something what has happened here. And there is something in between. And there is in between the objects which 
form the image of our, um, of our object. So we have to do something with this, um, uh, with the information about the, our system, so uh, which form the image, and we also want to know something about the 3D distribution of our sample, uh, refractive index of our sample. So uh, on the uh, other words, we have to take into account the microscope transfer function or the point spread function of our microscope, and we know that what is doing uh, the objective lens, it is um, cut the special content uh, of the field uh, which is diffracted by our uh, sample. So there are different also approaches how to solve this complicated problem. And for that, we have returned again to the Helmholtz equation. But now we would like to resolve this Helmholtz equation not in the free space, but in the, because we are not now working in the, in the field of the image formation, because in the image we don't uh, have anything between the, uh, the plane, this is a free space. But uh, we have to resolve uh, this equation inside of our sample. And uh, we can say that uh, refractive index in that case is a variable because it depends of the refractive index of our, of our sample. So we have uh, to consider this problem. Um, we can simplify it. Uh, so we add, uh, we add here the refractive index of the surrounding medium where the sample, where the cell is mounting. For example, it might be uh, water, so in zero let us think that it is a water. And uh, then we rewrite this expression like uh, something which we know how to resolve because this the Helmholtz equation for the free space propagation, and we know what is the point spread function in that case. And on the other side, what we have is uh, the differences between uh, the squares of the refractive index of the mounted medium and our sample, our object. Uh, and this expression, which is in blue, we call like an optical potential. So first of all, we can resolve uh, the uh, Helmholtz equation in the free space uh, because uh, the green function in that case it is known. And after that, we tried uh, to find the approximate equation for this inhomogeneous uh, case. So there are different uh, also approximation of this uh, Helmholtz equation solution. So paroxysmal one, uh, uh, econal approximation, born or also called related approximation. When or it is also called like a small perturbation method. When we are looking for the complex field amplitude, like a complex uh, field amplitude of the. Uh, um, uh, obtained for the uh, homogeneous equation, and this is the first or the second uh, um, uh, type of approximation of this solution, which uh, we can can find using this uh, perturbation method. We, uh, so this approximation is linear with this bond of the complex field amplitude, like we can see from this expression. But we can also apply another one, which is a rate of uh, approximation, and uh, 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 which is just not linear and multiplicative with respect to the complex field amplitude and expressed in the following uh, in the following way. So the difference between uh, them we will find a little bit further, but uh, maybe I would like to tell you that uh, the first born approximation, if we cut it here, doesn't take into account the multiple um, scattering while 
the rate of approximation uh, uh, does it, but uh, only the forward uh, scheduling is taken into account in this case. So, uh, uh, the first uh, one, probably the simplest one, is the geometrical optics approximation. So, we suppose that the smooth uh, uh, changes of our field on the wavelengths, and in that case, we don't take into account the diffraction. So, we use the Debye approximation, and we obtain in the first uh, approximation the famous Aikanal uh, equation. And from that, we can say something about the accumulated phase. Like he, uh, here, uh, we add uh, uh, two pi over lambda if we consider the entire phase. So is uh, this method allow us to say something about the 3D information of our uh, object? And uh, uh, the answer is partially yes. Uh, using, for example, the phase, uh, the phase tomography. So the idea is the following. So we use the hologram. This it is uh, offline holograms, and so this is uh, acoustic optical modulators, which allow us the shifting in order to recover the phase information of our object. And what we are doing, again, in the back focal plane of our condenser lens, we will focus our beam in the different points. So if we will focus it in the centrum, so we have the plane wave in the direction of Z, which is illuminated our object. And we have a one project, uh, projection, which corresponds to this accumulation phase in the direction. And if we put it somewhere uh, apart from the centrum, so we have another uh, uh, plane wave which is inclined with respect to the first one. So we have another projection. So the situation is very similar what we have in uh, X-ray computed tomography. But in that case, we are speaking about the phase and not the absorption, which is also the case of the current study of the X-ray tomography. And then recovering uh, this, uh, this projection, but of course we cannot recover its projection from all uh, by uh, interval uh, degree because you have uh, here uh, the, the, this inclination uh, wave uh, uh, diffracted by the sample have to enter into the objective. So there is a certain limitation and this limitation in that case it is uh, 60, 60 degrees. So uh, using uh, another problem is that in X-ray tomography, what the people are measuring is the projection in this plane. But we have uh, only the position of our CCD camera in that direction. So uh, we need some additional um, correction to the projection that we measure that can, can be done using formula. Uh, so uh, thus, uh, using uh, 81 phase images, four hologram images per, uh, per uh, 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 no, four hologram per uh, every image, we are able, um, so four hologram, why, why we need four hologram in order to recover the phase, for every, uh, uh, every one of these images. So we are able, uh, using like a radon tomography uh, procedure, inverse radon procedure, to recover the information in this, uh, in this case uh, about the refractive index of the Heller cell. And uh, here you see the results where uh, the nucleoli, uh, which has the larger uh, uh, refractive uh, index between that and that uh, part, uh, are shown in this uh, green, green color. So it is nice. So we can use somehow this approximation to get the information. But <coughs> can we do something 
better. So let us now return to the Born approximation and we consider the first Born approximation. In this case, we can find, because in the previous case, we don't take into account that uh, you have the, uh, the point spread function of our microscope. So we have to do it somehow. So uh, uh, in the first Born approximation resolving the homogeneous uh, uh, equation, Helmholtz equation, we can recover the green function, and after that, uh, substituting to the non homogeneous one, we find that the first approximation is given by the following uh, integral, where uh, G is the green function and V is our optical potential. So, our idea is to recover this information. But, uh, of course, we uh, have a certain approximation when we use it. So, for the first uh, order approximation, we suppose that the scattering is weak. So, uh, the magnitude of the scattered light is much uh, uh, smaller than the magnitude of the incident one, and that they are diffracted only once. It means that uh, uh, we don't consider the diffraction between the scattered light. Um, so we can say that the calculation of this, uh, this uh, first uh, approximation to the complex field amplitude is similar to the problem of calculation of the field created by independent uh, sources. Um, using this approximation and the similar setup that I showed you before, uh, and maybe uh, again with a coherent illumination, because uh, as in the previous case, uh, people are using the laser illumination, but with this inclination. Uh, so, uh, and using the deconvolution, supposing that the uh, point spread function of our system or green function is invariant with respect to uh, the shift invariant. So we have this convolution type equ uh, equation, which we can knowing what is the, uh, this uh, G, recover the information making the deconvolution process. So if we, know, if we see that uh, we, exp uh, we can write the uh, first order approximation in the form of convolution, so if we go to the Fourier domain, it will become more easier. Uh, so we have the Fourier transform of uh, the first order approximation is equal to Fourier transform of product of our uh, optical potential, which is our goal to recover that, multiplied it by the illumination, which may, may, may suppose that it is a constant, and multiplied by the uh, Fourier transform of our green function, which is a coherence transfer function. So uh, measuring or estimating from some uh, theoretical consideration the coherence transfer function, we are able to divide it and to recover the information about uh, the optical potential. But of course, it is very easy to say that we only divide it for that, but in general, it is quite a complex problem because uh, uh, we not allow to dividing for the small numbers because uh, we will enlarge uh, um, artificially uh, the noise uh, and uh, the results will be very strange. So there are a lot of, so the deconvolution is quite a challenging task and there is a different regularization method which are applied in order to recover uh, the optical uh, potential in the conditions. So here uh, it was applied for this uh, configuration and uh, also uh, the after um, um, using this inclined illumination are able to improve the frequency content of the images that we are uh, recovering. Um, 
and uh, using uh, 240 holograms, they uh, recover, so it, it, it's a lot of task, uh, at least, they recover the uh, fluctuation of the refractive index of the E. coli bacteria, which are represented here, where here you have the uh, delta N, which is the uh, different uh, um, perturbation of the uh, refractive index with respect to the what we measure originally. So, but how we can at least theoretically approximate this point spread function of our objective? So we know that the green function for the free propagation is written in this form, but we also know that when it's propagated through the objective, not all spatial frequency can pass. So we have this limitation which, which are related to the uh, uh, numerical aperture of our objective. And uh, we see also here that it is related to our space. So, so this is related to our uh, transfer uh, resolution, and this is related to our resolution in the direction. So uh, we can then modify what we have uh, to the free space, uh, free space propagation, multiplying it by the pupil size and multiplying it by this uh, nations that allow us to calculate only the propagation in the direction of, uh, of uh, calculate only uh, the light which is propagated to the um, direction of beam propagation, uh, which really uh, was measured by our system. Uh, so uh, if we now return back to the partially coherent light and to write it for the first order Born approximation. Uh, so we can write the expression for the mutual intensity in the case uh, of the light passing through the uh, objective and through the, uh, our sample and uh, to write it for the image. And uh, uh, if we write it for the coherent case, so uh, substituting uh, uh, here that uh, this is uh, the, the mutual intensity uh, of elimination, it's almost, uh, it's only the, 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 the product of uh, complex field amplitude multiplied by complicated one. We uh, find that the intensity distribution is equal to the intensity distribution of our illumination and these two twin terms that we have in the Gabber picture of the inline holography, except one thing. So what we cut here is the intensity distribution of our uh, scattered field. So this is the price what we uh, pay using this Born approximation. So these two pictures are quite, di quite different because they already belong to the second order approximation that we don't ca consider. So because of that, we are saying that uh, this part has to be too sm uh, too, uh, more smaller than the intensity distribution of our of our illumination. Uh, so uh, after that, uh, using uh, the uh, dividing the optical potential into part, one of them correspond to the phase part, uh, 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 which is only the accumulation of the phase during the propagation through the sample, and another one which is related to the absorption part, substituting in the formula I show you before, we can separate somehow the part which is related to the phase accumulation and to the absorption. We say that we can separate them. So R uh, big in that case is the frequency representation of our intensity distribution. 
So writing Z, it seems that they are separated, but they separated, but they, they we have here a sum. So directly we cannot uh, separate it, measuring only, uh, for example, this uh, uh, this intensity distribution and in 3D stack and making the Fourier, trans, uh, Fourier transform of them, we cannot recover information about the phase even if we know what is uh, the uh, uh, transfer function for the uh, phase and for the amplitude. Uh, so we need to make some circles and probably to play with a different uh, state of the uh, uh, coherence uh, of the illuminated beam. Why? Because if we look here, you have this, you have this uh, C, uh, SR term, which is, uh, which corresponds to intensity distribution, which you suppose incoherent over the condensed aperture. So might be playing with that, we will be able to separate them, but we need additional measurements for that, for the different state of the coherence. So, uh, uh, we'll st uh, stop in two minutes well, uh, and we will continue tomorrow. Uh, so, uh, here you see the um, uh, optical transfer function for the case of the different state of the coherence. So, this is a less coherence uh, and this is a more coherent light. And so, you have that the frequency content, which is permitted but by our microscope uh, is larger in the case of the partially coherent light than in the coherent light. So maybe instead of doing this point by point scanning, which I saw you before in the case of the uh, tomographic uh, reconstruction of the uh, uh, 3D representation of uh, our object, we can use the partially coherent light and try to recover this 3D information in uh, less shots that we have uh, in the previous case. Um, then we have uh, another type of approximation, which is a Ritter one, but probably we will return to that tomorrow when proper condition. It's a like a uh, good time to stop at this point. Uh, so uh, do we have some questions? Thank you for the very nice and informative presentation. I uh, had uh, actually two questions. Uh, the first one is about that you have uh, you had a publication I uh, seen that you used partially coherent light to avoid speckle and then use a very nice method actually to derive the coherent uh, intensity function without a speckle and then to retrieve the phase. But actually I've seen something vice versa in the articles that they uh, put a speckle, um, a diffuser on a wet light to produce the speckles, not to avoid them, and yeah, then yeah. retrieve the phase. So what would yeah. be the difference between these two yeah, methods? Yeah, there is a difference, there is a difference. So this is like a structural elimination. Yes. So, how, what, so there is a different... Uh, the different methods. So uh, totally different methods. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. different, right. Uh, and my other question was about the trade-off that you've been mentioning about the fringe spacing and the CCD pixel size. Um, actually, I was we were doing holography for quite a couple of years, and I was always thinking about uh, if we could make the fringes so fine uh, that they would uh, produce Mare fringes with the CCD pixels itself. I wanted to check if you have seen or such an application or seen it yourself have been doing uh, such an application of the, Mare, uh, of the holographic fringes. I don't understand what you're saying. Uh, uh, I so mean that, uh, is, the, is it, I want to re, uh, re, restate my question this way. Is it possible to make fringes so fine that they conform Mare fringes with the CCD pixels so that we could do a kind of um, extending the resolution that way too, maybe. Maybe I, I, I'm you haven't seen. Not working in, in ah. this uh, in holographic microscopy, so it, it's something like inline holography. It's uh, it's uh, almost uh, the same as we saw. So is uh, is uh, 
So, so is in linolography, you have the same stack, but you have, after that, to treat it in the different way. So you can uh, treat it like, uh, uh, like uh, with iterative process, you can treat it with uh, TA equations, and we also can treat it like, uh, like a Gabor allography and try to reconstruct it. But, but not in, in, online, uh, in uh, offline allography, um, there are also the method, of course, to recover the more special content about uh, this. Uh, but, uh, but what I think, I, I, I don't remember the publication. Thank you very much for a nice presentation. Thank you. Any more questions? OK, so I think um, ho hopefully you will get some more questions after the next part. Okay. Uh, so uh, maybe we should stop now then and uh, lunchtime.